My name's uh, Dr. David Larson. I'm an associate professor of public health at Syracuse University. And today I'm not going to talk about Shark Week with the Discovery Channel, though I do appreciate the good television it does. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the most dangerous animal in the world. And ask yourself, what do you think the most dangerous animal in the world is? And so the correct answer is the mosquito. The mosquito kills more humans than all other animals combined, including humans with wars and everything. Mosquitoes are the deadliest animals that exist on this planet. But not all of our mosquitoes on the planet are created equal. Some don't hurt humans at all. Some prefer to eat uh, bird blood or prefer to eat other animals. Some do like humans. Here's three different types of mosquitoes, three different genus of mosquitoes. And any idea which are the deadliest? All right, this bottom right here, this is a Culex mosquito. It's primarily a nuisance biting mosquito, but it can transmit diseases like West Nile virus, Eastern equine encephalitis that we have here in upstate New York. This top left here is an A an 80s albopictus mosquito. It's also called the Asian tiger. And it can transmit diseases like dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. And this middle one here is the most dangerous in the world. It's, a, it's an actually an Anopheles gambier. And the Anopheles genus is what transmits the parasite malaria. And so these mosquitoes that transmit malaria, or this, this specific mosquito, the Anopheles gambier, it has kind of a hunchback look to it, but it's the most dangerous mosquitoes in the world. Malaria is a parasite that infects red blood cells. And so this picture here is a microscope picture showing red blood cells from a human. Each of these little circles is a blood cell, right? And this lighter portion of the blood cell is a nucleus. Now you'll notice that there's these purple dots in some of them. So these are malaria parasites in some of these blood cells. And they're different stages of their life cycle. The malaria parasite life cycle is incredibly complex. And so we can start here where a mosquito takes a bite. And if that mosquito is infected with malaria at the life stage called a sporozoite, then those sporozoites enter into the bloodstream and they find their way to the liver. And that starts the liver stage of the malaria parasite. And so these infected liver cells, they turn into what's called a schizont. And so one cell will produce lots of different parasites. It will then rupture, and these parasites called merozoites, these parasites enter into the blood stage. And in the blood stage, they infect the red blood cell, like the previous picture I showed. And these, these uh, one, one parasite will go into a red blood cell, develop, and produce lots of different parasites, right? Creates a schizont and it ruptures and you get this cycle where you're increasing the number of parasites exponentially. And one characteristic of malaria is that these schizonts rupture at about the same time. And so you get these cyclical fevers where it takes between, depending on the species of the malaria, there's five actually that affect humans. Depending on the species, it might take three or four days for these guys not to rupture, but every third or fourth day, you get really, really sick, really high fevers, achy, just not feeling well. Now some of, so this is asexual reproduction. And at some point, this trophozoite here start undergoes gametocyte reproduction, sexual reproduction. And so it changes the cycle a little bit to produce gametocytes. Right? And so it's the same red blood cell, but it just starts producing slightly different type of parasites. And there's male and female gametocytes, right? And these gametocytes are what then get picked up by a mosquito. Perhaps a different mosquito picks up these gametocytes. And in the mosquito's gut, the gametocytes form an oocyst. And then they move outside the gut through what's called an okinete. Oh, then the oocyst, okinete, and then the oocyst. And eventually they make their way into the salivary glands and that mosquito takes another blood meal. 
and then passes it on. And so we have the human cycle of malaria, and we have the mosquito cycle of malaria. The mosquito cycle can take between one and two weeks. So between one and two weeks of this mosquito biting, a human developing the malaria parasite to get into the salivary glands and then injecting the parasite into a different human. The human stage can also take, it, be, it takes at least one week, but then the gametocytes and the erythrocytic cycle, this can be perpetual. And there's one, one species of malaria called Plasmodium, um, Plasmodium vivax that actually has an extended liver stage uh, for a long time. So it's quite a complex, quite a complex parasite. Now malaria has been, is incredibly impactful in the world. And so when we look at the leading causes of death, these are global, worldwide leading causes of death in 1990 and 2019, right? You start out, you have neonatal disorders, lower respiratory infections, diarrheal disease. Malaria is the 10th leading cause of death worldwide in 1990, but then it dropped down to the 14th leading cause of death in, in 2019. I'll talk a little bit about why. There's been some progress against malaria. Among children, malaria has actually increased as the leading cause of death. In the 1990, it was sixth, just below measles, but the measles vaccine is so effective it's dropped down to 11th and malaria increased to fifth. And when I started going to school for public health, malaria killed 1 million children every year. And, and, and that was about 2010, 2000, I started in 2013, no, when did, I, when did I start? 2007, I started in 2007, um, sorry there. And so, that malaria killed about 1 million children every year. 20 years before that, it killed 20 to th or two, 2 to 3 million every year. But today, it's a little bit better. It kills about 700, 500,000 children, 700,000 total people. So we have had progress. But historically, malaria has been extremely bad. Some historians, they estimate that half of all human deaths can be attributed back to malaria, which is mind-boggling to say the least but it's a very very bad parasite so let's go through a little bit of just how bad malaria can be so malaria infects the red blood cells and there's what's called red blood cell polymorphy polymorphisms these are genetic traits that have been adapted and they change the structure of a red blood cell to make people less likely to get severe disease from malaria and so malaria is driving this evolution in humans where where the red blood cells are changing the only problem is is that some of these changes are actually quite dangerous and so you may be familiar with sickle cell trait or sickle cell anemia so these donut shaped cells are healthy uh, typical red blood cells they can carry oxygen from the lungs to the cells very well these sickle sh shaped blood cells cannot carry as much oxygen. And that causes what's called anemia, um, which is a iron commonly known as iron deficiency, but it's basically the, a lack of hemoglobin in the blood, and that's what gives us energy and, and allows us to, to exercise or, to, or just do our daily tasks, um, to think and to learn. And so the sickle cell is less effective. So people born with sickle cell disease they typically don't survive past their 15th birthday. Um, in the United States, they do survive because of advanced medicine, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, they typically don't. Now, people born without sickle cell trait, they have less protection from malaria, so they might die from malaria. But it's these people that have sickle cell trait where it's genetically, it's the heterozygous combination of sickle cell and non-sickle cell um, uh, not, uh, genes, and then they get a little bit of protection from malaria because of the sickle cell, but then they don't get sick from the sickle cell because it's just the trait and not the disease. And so it's this, it's called a deleterious evolution or de deleterious attribute where it's beneficial in the majority of people, but then a, sub, a subgroup, it's actually, it's actually deadly. And malaria is even more deadly than the sickle cell disease historically, right? 
between up to half a million babies are born every year with severe forms of these anomalies. And sickle cell trait's not the only one. But malaria has driven these, these uh, polymorphisms, the genetic polymorphisms, and this, these cause complications for health. These babies will have, these, these people will have complications their entire lives, you know, uh, genetic disorders that will have to be managed. So you might be familiar with Brexit, it's a couple years ago, but malaria is so bad that it caused Brexit. Is that true? Well, if you go back to the, the late 1600s, the country of Scotland was independent from the country of England, or the Kingdom of Scotland, independent from the Kingdom of England. And Scotland took half of its sovereign wealth. So this is all the very wealthy landowners and merchants in the country. And they wanted to establish a colony in Panama. And this is the time when the Europeans were, were uh, rushing to exploit the people and the resources of the Americas for their own gain. And so they spent half of their money on this colony in Panama, but the colony failed. It, it was, and, and that failure then bankrupted the country. And that bankruptcy led to the signing of the Treaty of Union and actually formed the United Kingdom. Well, why did the colony fail? It was because of mosquito-borne disease, uh, malaria, yellow fever. And so the, the Scottish people, they, they were just too sick. The colony was just too sick. And so it failed completely. So here's another question. Malaria is so bad that it caused the Civil War. All right. When we look at the history of slavery in the United States, we see a pattern of the North and the South, where the North had less slavery of African peoples than the South did. And the North primarily relied on indentured servants. They would come over, they would work seven years as an indentured servant without pay. The person would pay their passage and then they would be free. And the South tried some indentured servants, but the indentured servants kept getting sick and they kept getting sick from malaria. And so this map here from 1870 shows the relative burden of mortality from malaria across the then United States. At that, mo at that moment in time, this is how far the United States would spread. And so you see the north here in New York, there's some around here, you know, central New York, where we have a lot of water. But primarily the north has very little malaria deaths compared to the south, especially South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, very heavy malaria deaths. And so the malaria transmission in the South led the, 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 the colonists and the, the landowners of the South to value, they, they then valued African slave labor more greatly because the Africans that they brought over were naturally resistant to the malaria that was circulating. And so the infectious diseases, the m malaria specifically, helped promote this Afri African slave trade. It made it even more valuable for these merchants to deal in, in human slavery. And this, um, Dr. Elena Esposito, she has a very great article on this called Side Effects of Immunity in the African Slave Trade. And so that, and we know that slavery was the, was the predominant issue of the Civil War. And so malaria had a roundabout contribution to the United States Civil War through the African slave trade. Now malaria being a mosquito-borne disease is associated with increased poverty. This bottom right, gra this bottom right map shows the extent of malaria transmission historically. So these blue areas here are prone to what's called epidemic malaria, where malaria is not around very often, but then it might come in and sweep through in the summer times. And so you have Western Europe, Russia, Australia, the United States here, more moderate climates, temperate climates, where, let, where the, the specific malaria mosquitoes are not, uh, don't survive as well and they don't transmit malaria as well. Malaria still existed. It existed in the United States, definitely had epidemics of malaria um, as, long as, as long as the United States has been around. It existed in Western Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, he, uh, he lured the English into Holland 
and the English invaded Holland to fight uh, Napoleon and Napoleon actually broke a lot of the dams and the dikes that controlled the floods of Holland and let the countryside flood and then the English had to retreat because their whole army was sick with malaria and they couldn't fight. Um, these lighter green areas are where it is endemic so you have consistent transmission and then uh, but it's very light and then the darkest green area is where it's really intense that transmission. And you notice where the darkest areas are right they're right here in the tropics and if you look at wealth wealth is and this is this what's called the human development index and it's a measure of you know do you have access to indoor plumbing do you have access to electricity do you have access to education and if you look at wealth wealth is primarily concentrated in the temperate climates north america western europe australia um, japan and korea and then the poverty is primarily concentrated in the tropics. And one of the, one of the theories is called, ge it's called geographic determinism. But uh, one theory is that the geography, and by geography, you know, we have malaria, the, the susceptibility of an, of, a, of an area to have malaria transmission, that drives the, the poverty or the development, human development. Now, in the United States, we don't hear much about malaria transmission. That's because we are malaria free. We have eliminated malaria transmission. There's no more malaria here in the United States. Every now and again, somebody will come from another country, bring the malaria parasite, and it might spread even beyond that person. We call that airport malaria, but it doesn't spread very far. And it, it, it doesn't reestablish itself. The primary reason the United States is free from malaria is indoor air conditioning and indoor sleeping. So we've begun to sleep inside because we have air conditioning and and uh, that reduces our exposure with the with the mosquitoes that transmit malaria. And this and we we had malaria transmission in the United States up until the 1950s and when we got rid of it. And Western Europe's similar, Russia as well, many different countries throughout the world, but notice they all are in the temp more temperate climates. And then these blue countries here are all in what's called the mo are, are all in the process of eliminating malaria. So they're trying to get rid of transmission from from their borders. And the uh, red is is not quite ready to eliminate, but they're still trying to control. I'll give you a timeline of malaria. And so malaria is an old old disease. It's Latin for bad air, and it was it was uh, thought to be associated with swamp gas. But in the 1570s, there was a bark from a cinchona tree, and this is, grows in the Andes, it's a type of a pine tree. And it was brought back to Europe. It was taken from, from South America where the Jesuit priests had learned that the, that the indigenous people there, they chewed this bark and used it in medicines. And so they brought it back and it was introduced into Europe. And then in, in, over the next 200 years, they found the most effective type of cinchona bark that could fight malaria. And they, in 1820, they isolated the actual chemical in the cinchona bark, and it's a chemical called quinine, or quinine. And the, that's when they, in the, a few years later, they started large-scale prophylaxis. So they started this, uh, a gin and tonic is a type of alcoholic drink, where you mix gin with quinine water, and that helps to reduce malaria, if you have it. Uh, so they started putting quinine in different in different uh, foods and different medicines. It wasn't until 1880 that the actual malaria parasites were identified in the blood, and it was Charles Lovren discovered the malaria parasites in human blood. In 1897, Ronald Ross discovered that the parasites were found in the Anopheles mosquitoes, and then dissecting the salivary glands found the parasites there. And then in 1898, Bignami and Grassi, two Italians, proved that mosquito transmission um, was the driving cause of malaria. And, and if you want to be part of their experiments, it's kind of crazy. They put a person with malaria and mosquitoes in one room, and then they had a vent or a tube that the mosquitoes could come over to the next person in the next room, and they just watched the person get infected. In 1934, the U.S. military developed the drug chloroquine. It's a derivative of quinine. And 
and then in 1939, DDT was discovered to have insecticidal properties. And DDT is a, a chemical, you may have heard of it with Silent Spring, which I'll talk a little bit about. But now we had chloroquine and DDT, two very important tools to fight malaria. And soon after chloroquine was discovered, it was started to put in the salt, and then resistance was started to be observed, where the parasite grew resistance to the drug. But still, there's a lot of hope around DDT, and with chloroquine is somewhat effective, and so the World Health Organization established the Global Malaria Eradication Program. Five years later, they, the pyrethroids were synthesized. This is a, a insecticide that's derivative from the chrysanthemum flower. And then in 1962, Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring. And Silent Spring is a fantastic, uh, it's a seminal work of science literature where Rachel Carson shows the all the bad things that can happen if you just dumped insecticides into the environment. And she proposed a future where no birds would be singing because all these insecticides were killing off the birds and the insects in the environment. In 1970, the sulfadoxine pyrimethamine was introduced as a first-line drug. It's not a quinine derivative, it's a different one. And in 1972, DDT was banned in the U.S. And it was a direct, it was a direct response to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and the fears. And once DDT was banned in the U.S., not many other countries, if any, were really producing DDT at the same scale, and it was the, and it was basically lost as an intervention. At the same time, to Yu Yu, she demonstrated the anti-malarial properties of artemisinin. She has since won a Nobel Prize in medicine. And at the same time, malaria eradication was deemed infeasible. You know, we lost chloroquine with drug resistance. We lost DDT. And the 1970s kicked off what malaria scientists call the dark ages of malaria, where we had, we discovered permethrin from pyrethroids, but in the 1980s we saw widespread sulfadoxine pyrimethamine. And we just didn't have any tools to fight malaria. We had no first line drugs that worked. Sulfadoxine pyrimethamine was, was problematic. Arte, artemisinin was not yet available. Um, Tuyu Yu was in China, where artemisinin is native and um, the plant that grows artemisinin is native, and there just wasn't a lot of interaction um, with, with Sub-Saharan Africa, where most malaria was. Mefalcon was introduced in 1980. It didn't last very long. But in 1985, we started the first experiments with insecticide-treated mosquito nets. And, you know, 1990, Mefalcon was resistant. We just lost that drug. In 1995, we did community randomized experiments with insecticide-treated mosquito nets. And so we're developing this new tool to fight malaria. Our 1995, we introduced finally artemisinin combination therapy. And in 2000, the Gates Foundation is established. Insecticide mosquito nets are shown to reduce all cause mortality by 17%. The Global Fund is created in 2002. We begin, we begin mass net distributions and the President's Malaria Initiative is established. And so you look at the early 2000s as almost this renaissance in malaria control with this idea that we actually have tools now. We have, a, we have what are called ACTs, artemisinin in combination therapy. We have insecticide treated mosquito nets. And so we have, now have philanthropists like the Gates Foundation pushing for malaria control. We have the creation of the Global Fund, which wealthy nations donate into and then they distribute money for disease control to fight. It's to fight HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. And then President George W. Bush, he establishes a President's Malaria Initiative with a huge, huge investment in malaria control. In 2007, Bill Gates issues a, a reissues a malaria eradication challenge. Whereas it was deemed infeasible to eradicate malaria, it's always going to be around in 1972. And now 2007, you know, we're 35 years later, says let's put malaria eradication back on the table. And that caused quite a controversy. In 2008, artemisinin resistance is observed. And then, I know it's been 13 years since then, but I'll talk a little bit about developments. And so the insecticide treated mosquito net, I'll kind of introduce that. I consider the insecticide treated mosquito net as one of the greatest medical discoveries in the last 30 years. And you know, and it's such a simple tool. You treat the mosquito net with insecticide, and when that mosquito comes and lands on that 
and sex is on that net looking for a blood meal, that mosquito dies. And so not only are you protecting the person underneath the net, but if that mosquito has a malaria parasite, you're taking that mosquito out of circulation and it cannot transmit malaria to other people. Sorry there. And so I, so these ITNs, insecticide treated mosquito nets, are very, very effective. So I was on a team that we estimated that they saved a million lives, a million children's lives were saved um, just by the mosquito nets from 2001 to 2010. They're very equitable, right? And so this, this figure here on the bottom left shows the, the poorest in the red, the, their coverage in the blue, or the purple is the richest. Some things like a skilled birth attendant, you know, the poorest, poorest women don't have skilled birth attendants very often, just 30% of the time, whereas the richest have them almost all the time. But breastfeeding is basically very, very equitable. Everybody starts breastfeeding early, independent of love. And mosquito nets, at the early days, they were pretty equitable, right? Between 10 to 20% with not a lot of gap between. And we've distributed hundreds of millions of nets in Sub-Saharan Africa. I won't talk too much about the old nets, what's done with those, or the surplus nets. Um, but hundreds of millions of nets have been distributed. I think it's up to 2 billion nets have been distributed. And we've gone from, in 2000, less than 10% of children sleeping under mosquito net in 2015 more than 50 percent in many countries and this is a one of the huge public health victories of the 21st century is the scale up of insecticide treated mosquito nets and the reduction of malaria it's shifted it's cut the malaria deaths by more than half these mosquito nets um, and so a few other things so we have potential ins so first all, I guess I'll start with the threats to malaria control elimination so we have these awesome insecticide treatment mosquito nets, but there's a developing insecticide resistance, and the threat that we could lose this tool is, is real. We have the threat of drug resistance. We, right now we use artemisinin combination therapies. There is documented resistance, especially in the Mekong River Delta of, uh, I want to say Cambodia, but yeah, Cambodia. Um, Cambodia and Thailand, Southeast Asia area. And if we lose these frontline drugs, you know, we've lost a huge tool. And the other threat is political apathy, is people just stop caring. You know, we saw a decline. President George W. Bush established the President's Malaria Initiative with a lot of gusto, huge investments. And then we've seen a decline since then from President Obama to President Trump in terms of how much President's Malaria Initiative funding and, and international support the United States is willing to give. Other infectious diseases, they threaten malaria control. And so we had a big Ebola outbreak in 2013, I believe. And it was in Western Africa, in Guinea, um, Niger, and Liberia. And more people died from malaria than Ebola. Ebola is a virus that it really rips at the heart of health systems. It affects health workers more often than other folks. And it just kills you know, 30 to 50% of people that it infects. It's just a very scary, dangerous disease. Um, but it doesn't spread as easily as, as something like COVID. But it, it just eviscerated the health system as people trying to fight it, and then you lose track of control, ma malaria control. And so we had um, huge amounts of malaria deaths following Ebola. COVID-19, it's a similar fear. that the, the, the attention and the fight for COVID-19, that reduces the capacity of public health institutions to fight malaria. And so we might see a rise in malaria-related death um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, we'll, a lot of people ask, well, what about a vaccine? So malaria is a parasite, and it's a very complex organism relative to viruses. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of times more, more complex. And it's been, people have been working for this, scientists have been working for 70 years to develop vaccines. Dozens and dozens of vaccine candidates in phase one, phase two trials, some making it to phase three. But the genetic complexity and the complexity of the life cycle make it really complicated to develop an effective vaccine. So right now we have what's called an RTSS vaccine. It's about 50% effective at reducing disease. You know, um, doesn't reduce infection, just reduces disease. And it's currently under what's called a phase four trial in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so phase four is where it's been shown to be effective. That's where we get the 50% from but now let's see if we can roll it out. And there's complications with it. 
it doesn't follow the vaccine schedule for for like the vaccines of polio, measles, uh, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus. It's an, so it's hard to distribute. It requires four doses, three over nine months, and then a fourth dose a few years later. So it's a very complex delivery schedule. It's just a difficult vaccine to deliver. Um, and then recently you may have heard in the news about a possible malaria vaccine, the R21 in Burkina Faso. And th that's good, you know, we're making progress against malaria vaccines. The vaccinologists are learning and developing these things. But, every, but, but we just have to have caution because every year or two years, there's good news about a new candidate and it makes the news and then, and then we learn how to distribute it. And so while I hope for a malaria vaccine, I know that at the same time that we hope for a malaria vaccine, we need to understand that malaria is controllable without one. And specifically, if we have the political will and we have the resources to fight it, we could actually do a lot more than we're doing now. So I hope you've learned a bit about malaria and uh, happy to answer any questions via email if anything comes up. And thanks.